um, park my car up and then the van come up behind me, flashed me and they all jumped out um, and then they, they, they took this girl uh, um, they said they said you've done good and uh, I don't know whether my family's going to be able to they they threatened they threatened to take my family away from me so at that point I'm, I'm doing what I can to protect my family Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Let's get straight into today's Dark Case. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Sarah and all those affected by this case. Sarah Everard was born on the 14th of June 1987 at Red Hill Hospital in Surrey. It wasn't far from the 1930s three-bedroom semi-detached home in Hawley, where her parents lived with her siblings James and Katie. Her mother Sue was a physiotherapist and her father Jeremy was one of the nation's most brilliant engineers. He was an expert in microwaves and low noise oscillators. After gaining a PhD from Cambridge in 1983, he went on to teach at King's College, London. When Sarah was six, he was made a professor of electronics at the University of York, and the family moved north to a new home in the city. Here, Sarah had a great childhood. She was bright and beautiful. Even as a child, she always put others first and had an amazing sense of humour. Her quick wit made it easy for her to make new friends. After finishing school in 2005, Sarah went on to study geography at Durham. But this was never her passion. Her warm, sociable personality made her a perfect fit for a career in marketing instead. After graduating, she immediately moved to London to embark on a career in marketing. Aged 33, her career was developing. She was living in Brixton Hill. She was in a happy relationship and the promise of her life was only growing. On March the 3rd, 2021, Sarah had gone to visit her friend in South London. Her friend lived in the Clapham Junction area, so she stopped in at a Sainsbury's in Brixton Hill to buy a bottle of wine on her way. This was a strange time, right in the mists of the lockdowns, so it was nice to have some normality, if only briefly. At around 9pm, Sarah headed home, walking around a big local park. Home was around 2.5 miles away and would take around 40 minutes. But Sarah was smart. She stuck to the brightly lit roads, not walking through the park itself, and she phoned her boyfriend for the first 15 minutes. She was also dressed in a bright green rain jacket, navy blue trousers with a white diamond pattern, turquoise and orange trainers, and a white beanie hat. Sarah was hard to miss. Now again, this was during the lockdowns. In the UK, you were only meant to be out of your home for one hour. And you also weren't supposed to meet other people unless they were within your bubble. Whilst Sarah met with her friend outside, she was still on edge about the lockdown rules. Shortly after 9.30pm, her worst fear was realised. Sarah was flagged down by a policeman. He told her she was breaching the lockdown guidelines. She chatted to the officer on the pavement outside Poinder's court, pleading with him to let her go with a warning. But he wouldn't relent. 
He showed her his police warrant card before putting her in handcuffs. Two witnesses watched as she was put into the back of an unmarked police car. The onlookers felt sorry for her. It seemed that she was arrested for simply being outside. But during that period, the UK was fed a lot of confusing messaging. Everything seemed to be against the rules. For us normal people, anyway. She'd probably broken the law, the onlookers assumed. Sarah wasn't someone who would ever just get into a car with a stranger. She, like most people, would have had the sense to run or scream or shout. A natural instinct. But when you're a law-abiding citizen who's under arrest, you don't really have a choice. And Sarah willingly complied. But when Sarah didn't come home the next day, her boyfriend sounded the alarm. The hunt for Sarah started almost immediately. The Metropolitan Police launched an official missing persons appeal for Sarah on the 6th of March. Posters were distributed across London and a media campaign was launched to find Sarah. The case was huge and her face was everywhere. There was still hope that Sarah might turn up alive and well. Police were combing through CCTV footage from the area. This included bus cameras and ring doorbells. They had no real idea what they were looking for, but they knew they needed to start with the police car that had picked up Sarah shortly after 9.30pm. They found bus camera footage that showed Sarah getting into a white Vauxhall Astra, and by a stroke of luck it had captured an image sharp enough to reveal the number plate. Inquiries led them back to Enterprise, a hire car company in Dover. Their staff handed over details provided by the person who had hired it. This included a mobile phone number. Detectives ran this number through their databases and to their absolute shock, this phone number had been registered by a serving police officer, a man named Wayne Cousins. Wayne Cousins was a normal family man with a wife and two children. He was born in 1972 in Kent. He was serving with the Metropolitan Police as a police constable and firearms officer. He had joined the Met in September 2018 and in February 2020 was assigned to the Parliamentary and Diplomatic Protection or PADP branch, the division responsible for uniform protection of government and diplomatic premises. Was it possible Possible that a serving officer could actually be responsible for Sarah's disappearance. The investigation gathered some steam. They slowly pieced together Cousins' movements after he picked Sarah up. He had left London completely and by 1am on the 4th of March, he was in the Tilmanstone area of Kent four hours after plucking Sarah off of the street. Several hours later at 8.30am, he returned the hire car. While the investigation into Everard's disappearance gathered pace, Wayne Cousins started to unravel. On the 5th of March, he reported to work that he was suffering from stress. On the same day at 2pm, he was captured by CCTV at a B&Q DIY store in Dover buying two green builder's bags for 9 94 On the 6th of March, he emailed his supervisor at the Met Police to declare that he no longer wanted to carry a firearm. The same day, he ordered a 2x2 meter tarpaulin, along with a bungee cargo net from Amazon. On the 8th of March, the day he was due back on duty, he declared to his supervisors that he was too sick to work. By Tuesday the 9th of March, detectives had enough to move in. At 7.50pm, Cousins was arrested at his home in Deal, Kent. Because of the hope that Sarah may still be alive, an emergency interview was authorised. This meant there was no need for a solicitor to be present. Arresting officers recorded the bizarre interview of Cousins in his own home on their body cameras. So we're here to talk to you about Sarah. Show you a picture. Do you okay. know Sarah? I don't know. Okay. Sarah went missing. Um, I'll show you some pictures of, of, of her on the day. Okay. Sarah went missing um, on Wednesday. And her parents obviously and her family are really worried about her. Now. The inquiry that's been conducted so far has led us to come and speak to you about it and to see what we, what we know about Sarah, okay? So, 
Would you like to? Do you know where Sarah is? No. Right. Okay. Do you know anything about what happened to her? I know that um, she went missing up in um, London somewhere. Um, what, about a week ago or so. Uh, just from what I've got on the news. Okay. Have you ever personally met her? No, not personally met her. Have you had any interactions with her at all? No, uh, why would why, why, why I have personal interactions with her? <coughs> well, it's very difficult because I can't go into a lot of the evidence because obviously that would require, that's not part of what an urgent interview is, okay? This interview is just about trying to find her. Sure. She's yeah. been missing for a while well, I'm, now. I'm sat in handcuffs and what I know her, so you must have something to say that I, I know her. Well, like I said, you've been arrested on suspicion of kidnap, and we believe that you've been involved in her disappearance and taking her away from her family. Okay. So we are trying to find her. Obviously, everybody is very worried about her. She's got, you know, parents, she's got, a, a, you know, she's siblings, she's got a boyfriend. There's a lot of people. That care about her. Um, sure, if you've sure. seen her on the news, the number of people that you know reach out about her sure. out there looking for her every day, and she's missing. And our job, our primary job here, is to find her and to try and find her at the safe and well. Okay. Now we believe that you know something about where she is, and that's why we're here to look for her and to try and find her. And that's why we're talking to you now is to try and get you to you know, have a good think about it. And just, you know, tell us anything you can about whether or not it's fine. Okay, um, well, I am in financial um, and I've been um, lent on by, um, I don't know who they are, they're a, a group, a gang, whatever, um, and they told me why I need to go and pick up girls and get them to them. So, um, I said, not happening. Um, and it then came through that they were going to harm my family, take them away, and they'll use them instead. Um, but at that point, I had no option to try and find somebody. So, I don't, um, there's just a couple of names. I was told a place to um, take her. That's it. That's all. That is all I know. This group of people. Tell me about them. I need to find them. Tell me everything you know. That okay. I that you'll help me there find. was a white sprinter van. Um, they um, are it was between sort of Lennon Maidstone area that I dropped her off. Um, I still don't know. I, I, I don't know. They they just I, I just um, parked my car up and then the van come up behind me, flashed me, and they all jumped out. Um, and then they, they, they took this girl. Uh, um, they said they said you've done good, and I, I don't know if my family's going to be alright still. But, they, they threatened, they threatened to take my family away from me. So, at that point, I'm, I'm doing what I can to protect my family. That's it. So, all I know is that it was a roundabout. I, we could drive there now, I could show you. But I, 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 roughly, I don't know Lenham, Maidstone area at all. If we did um, it on Google, if we did it on Google Maps, like Google Earth, if we drive it, would right. you like to do it? I drove from Ashford to Maidstone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a roundabout that breaks up, I guess. So this, this is the first big roundabout that I've come to. And you would carry straight over to Maidstone. But instead, I went round that roundabout and back up another road um, and at that point that I was flashed and pulled over um, you guys got out um, opened my door, opened that door um, pushed me out against the front of the car took the girl drove off
that's it they said we'll be in touch so I'm here I'm off work with stress because I'm here to protect my family I want to be here 24 7 for my family they come from my family I've got nothing myself I've got no choice I'll go back through the route with you in a minute all right but how do they contact you how did you contact them I tried to over on one of their call girls and rip her off mm -hmm. so she's told them and um they, they, they've got me so how do they know what i mean how do they contact you how, how is it they've been in contact with you to do, make these threats they just they just tell me be here be here so hotel burston down in folkestone got be here okay so i turned up um but I've got no mobile number and they have got my mobile number. They have They're obviously outside watching, following. I uh, just honestly How are they telling you to be there? They'll be there. How is it they're they giving those directions? Yeah, they'll they yeah. they'll they'll come outside. So they'll be outside here. Yeah. And then they'll say, Right, yeah. you're gonna be in Folkestone at this time or you're gonna be in Ashford at this time. And that's it. Okay. There's no links, no telephone numbers. I'm completely on my own, but at the same time being threatened. Um, it had um, Romanian plates on the on the van, um, uh, white, um, like Mercedes Sprinter type van. Cousins described the location and gave a description of the men, but no one was buying it. Instead, the police were more interested in a plot of land he and his wife had purchased in 2019. It was a small plot of woodland off of Frid Lane in Ashford. Phone data also sparked police interest in that small area. Intensive searches began and just before 5pm on the 10th of March, a body was discovered approximately 100 meters away from the area owned by cousins. The body of Sarah Everard was found in a large green builder's bag, similar to the one cousins had bought days earlier and left dumped in a stream. Sarah was identified by her dental records. Her promising life had been ended by strangulation. On that same day, Wayne Cousins was rearrested on suspicion of murder. A day later, he was hospitalised following a head injury sustained in custody. He was again briefly hospitalised the following day after another similar injury. Police said that his injuries were self-inflicted. Whilst he continued to try to escape justice, police pieced together Sarah's final hours. On March the 3rd, Wayne told his family he would be out working late. Then he drove to London, bought some essential things and started prowling the streets. He was deliberately looking for a woman on her own, someone he could trap. And there was Sarah walking by the park. She was doing everything right to stay safe, but she had no idea how much danger she was in. Wayne pulled up beside her and convinced her that she was being legally arrested. Arrested. He put handcuffs on her and drove her towards what she thought was a police station. Instead, he drove for 80 more miles before transferring her to his own car at 11.43am. By then, she must have been terrified, but she was completely unable to save herself, trapped in handcuffs. Not long after this, he throttled her, ending her life with his police uniform belt. He then stashed Sarah's remains in a fridge on the woodland that he owned. On March the 5th, he bought some gasoline in a can and tried to use it to dispose of her entirely, leaving the remains in the pond nearby. He thought he could get away with it and carry on with his life forever, but alas, he was charged with Sarah's kidnapping and murder on the 12th of March. On the 8th of July 2021, Wayne Cousins was now the one that was cuffed, scared and trapped against his will. He went on trial. He pleaded guilty to kidnap and intimate violations, and he admitted responsibility for Sarah Everard's death. 
The trial was highly publicised in the UK at the time. Sarah's death had called for an investigation into the Metropolitan Police and the Met didn't do themselves any favours in the weeks after the case was closed. They were forcibly, arguably violently, breaking up visuals to commemorate Sarah. Visuals that were mainly large groups of women. As the UK came to terms with the idea of a serving police officer brutally ending an innocent woman, the images of policemen manhandling peaceful protesters were not welcomed. They also came under fire for their failure to prevent this murder. Not only did police not take any action after an alleged incident of indecent exposure from Cousins in 2015, but he also faced at least two accusations of indecent exposure that had not been properly investigated earlier in 2021. Had these incidents been investigated properly by the Met at the time, Sarah may still be alive today. Sarah's mother said in her impact statement, she lost her life because Wayne Cousins wanted to satisfy his perverted desires. How could he value a human life so cheaply? He treated my daughter as if she was nothing and disposed of her as if she was rubbish. The judge agreed, calling what he did warped, selfish and brutal. The judge added in court that Wayne had only shown self-pity and attempted to avoid or minimise the proper consequences of what he had done. Because of this, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. He was given a whole life order, meaning he'll spend the rest of his life behind bars with no opportunity for parole. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Let me know down in the comments. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.